Anybody has any questions? Yes? Hi. Uh, I was wondering, since at the beginning you showed the picture of the younger man, the older man, whatever, and we all decided, of course, the younger man was more attractive. But then you went on to show, obviously, that all these young, gorgeous women have picked older men. So I guess one of the things I'm wondering about is, it was an animal behaviorist and sort of retired a few mm -hmm. years ago, but it was kind of basically generalized that there was mostly female choice in the animal right. world. And I was wondering, I don't even know whether that's true of primates where there's an alpha male, that there's still female choice. But would you say in our culture that female choice still exists, or does it exist perhaps in less, um, what's the word, uh, not civilized, but a less industrialized places that there's more female choice in, the in area? our culture? There, it definitely. Well, in humans, it's definitely male and female choice. Um, women are the gatekeepers. We're the ones that say no. So in that sense, we are the ones that make that final choice. However, when it comes to a committed relationship, it's going, it's going to be both. Both the male and female are both going to make that commitment. And one of the things on animal behavior, when you look at species that do either seasonal monogamy, which means they're monogamous for the season, so they don't stray, or lifetime monogamy, like um, gibbons and uh, swans. Often the, the, those very ornate rituals, especially we see in birds, um, grebes for example do this wonderful walking on water. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But they actually, they, they do it when they first are looking for a mate and they first kind of hit on one another. I mean all grebes look alike to me so I don't know what they, but, but they're looking at that behavior and it is a male-female choice, so they're both checking one another out. And once they've made it and they start doing the nesting, they actually perform that ritual far more often than when they were first mating. And again, it's to probably, it's thought, I mean, who knows the mind of a grebe, but to uh, reinforce that whatever hormones are released, whatever the, the bonding is released, that's released, and we do, we do know that there are certain chemicals involved with bonding. Um, so it, it, and, and it's released when we uh, make love. So um, there are lots, uh, you know, making love is, is, is one way that humans increase their bonding. So, um, and then we, in terms of animal behavior, in terms of, um, uh, there's, there's also some reversals where we see uh, the, the female is the aggressor, the males take care of the nests, and then we see the reverse behavior. We see the males being the choosy ones and the females having the typical sort of behavior that we see in the animal kingdom of, of the dominant male. Um, so, and then there's different, all kinds of different mating systems in the animal world, harems, um, and then, of course, prides, and where the strongest male is who simply takes it over and controls territory. So there's, but one of the beautiful things about studying evolution is, and I'm going to go off a little bit off track here. It's why I think it's so important to teach evolution to children, because it is so amazing to be able to look at a, a pair of animals and within a few moments of observation pretty much be able to predict what their mating habits are and how they raise their offspring. That's powerful. And isn't that cool for a kid to be able to do that and say, wow, I know because that male is brightly col colored and she's very dull like hummingbirds. The female is making the choice and she's raising the offspring off on her own. Male has nothing to do with it. Yes? Um, based on something you said earlier in your talk, it seems like for the first time in history, we're kind of doing counter-evolutionary things, like we're keeping people alive that would have died due to fitness issues. Uh, women are becoming empowered in a way 
that's different. Um, I know evolutionary time's long, but these changes in first world societies are coming pretty quickly. So are we well, yeah. somehow um, going to change? I mean, there, there's, there's, there's definitely been some discussion about um, human evolution, and um, personally I'm one of those who would like to say about Darwinian evolution when it comes to humans is the heck with it. I'm all for <laughs> vaccines and me medicine in hospitals and um, keeping people alive, I mean, other than, you know, through valiant efforts uh, when they have a life still to lead. So if that means that uh, humans change over evolutionary time, fine. That's great. That's my personal belief. Uh, there are those who say that it's probably not going to make a huge change. Um, and humans have been undergoing all kinds of change. Every time a new disease comes around that um, is worse than the next, um, we shape human behavior. I mean, hum the, the human gene pool. Um, Native Americans, of course, were pretty much wiped out, not so much by invading armies, but invading germs. Um, black Americans have a, rate, a higher rate of... Um, heart disease, and retention of salt. And the thought is that on the slave ships, the only ones who were able to survive those horrible, horrible journeys were those who were able to retain salt and fat. And now it's a curse because there's vending machines and McDonald's. So, um, so we see, so things like that, we've been shaping ourselves. We, we're self-domesticated, basically. So we have been shaping ourselves all throughout our history. The invention of agriculture completely changed humans in terms of how, who was able to survive uh, those who were able to process lactose or lactose tolerant, able to, to drink milk. And more people are able to drink goat's milk and sheep's milk than cow's milk because, cow, because cows came much later in the domestication than sheep and goats. So things like that, when you start looking at our history, we've been doing this for a long time. Now we're just a little quicker at it. Um, since there's so much uh, science writing that gets published, I'm amazed um, what they're willing to publish. Um, and it's so hard to know who really knows what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> who do you respect when they talk about um, uh, populational um, evolution? Oh. I, I'm really interested and wanting to know what, how much is there into that, and who should I respectfully read to know if I'm reading somebody who knows what they're talking about? Because I don't have any guidance. I'm not in school anymore, yeah. and I don't know who to trust. Do you feel that there's something to that? I mean, to the to in terms of um, populational evolution, or maybe like not. group selection? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, okay. I am not a group selectionist, um, so. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to me when I look at it, because the individual gene is always going to end up coming, coming on top. Um, Darwin, even though he didn't, he didn't know about right. genetics, was still, an in, he, was an in, he looked at the individual. Um, thing are, it's, there are some, perhaps, interesting arguments that have been presented, but even then, when it boils down to it, you're still looking at individual gene selection. So what you're saying is it's kind of counterintuitive. So I haven't picked anybody. Yes? Uh, all the attractiveness cues you've talked about have been visual. Do you have anything to say about non-visual attractive cues? Oh, yeah, Particularly, is there anything through pheromones? When it yep. I actually did one of the original studies on pheromones. So, um, And I didn't believe pheromones were, worked. I, I really didn't, which so which made me a very good experimenter because um, I was was uh, biased in the wrong in the direction that it did not come out. Um, the f pheromones. Okay, first let me just make this argument: do not buy them. <laughs> they are absolutely useless when it comes to what you see, uh, and two, they stink, horrible. Uh, how many of you guys remember what your junior high school locker room smelled like, kind of vaguely? It's pretty much what male pheromones smell like. Women's are a little nicer and sweeter. In fact, in the study I did, 
the descriptions I got of male pheromones were things like you know, lab, oh, lab chemistry, classrooms, locker rooms, urinals. And uh, the female um, pheromone was um, light, flowery, but the best response I had was, smells like girlfriend in the morning. Um, <laughs> I don't know how he <laughs> didn't, I, di I never knew who actually wrote that because I'm not, I didn't see who, who um, I don't see my particip participants and the data at the same time. But um, pheromones are a, well, odor is very important. Odor and pheromones aren't the same. Um, odor, as most of you know, Odor was how doctors originally would um, determine illness. Um, and we know when those of us who have been really ill, as we start getting better, the first thing we want to do is shower and change the sheets because we stink. Um, being ill gives off a certain odor. So odor is really important. Uh, pheromones play a role once that initial attraction occurs. Because we probably won't be that close to someone to smell their pheromones. And if we are close enough to smell their pheromones, it's probably pretty rank. Um, <laughs> because it probably is testosterone, and, and that's really not a nice smell. Um, it, it really... It, yeah, close it, yeah. So, but but what, the, what I found in my experiment was... Um, we paired pheromones, we had men and women smell, smelling pheromones, and we had them looking at images, like the ones I showed you, the computerized images that I did, um, of different levels of feminine versus masculine uh, facial characteristics. And what we found are the women who tended to like more masculine facial characteristics did not hate and I do mean, do not hate the testosterone smell as much as the women who showed more, uh, they, they liked more um, feminine characteristics in males, kind of the nice soccer dad look, tended to really hate the testosterone. And then we found the, with, with men it was the same way. Those men who really, really liked the very feminine faces, and, and all of them tended toward the feminine face, but they didn't, they rated it slightly different, so there was enough of a statistical difference to look at. But th those men tended to also show a stronger preference for the female pheromone, the estrogen-based pheromone. Um, now, some people can't smell it at all. However, we did find another experiment done in, up in Finland. Um, even people who could not smell it, um, there, were, there were brain reactions. And what was interesting, this was a study on heterosexual and homosexual uh, males. And the heterosexual males responded to the female pheromone the same way that homosexual males responded to the male pheromone in terms of showing a preference um, deep within the brain. So um, there's, there's definitely lots of evidence that the pheromones have some sort of, of play some sort of factor. And one of the thoughts is um, it's a way of detecting genes. And couples who are together will often talk about how they love the way their partner smells. And women especially do this when, the, if, when your partner leaves the bed, take his pillow, hug it, you know, roll over to his side of the bed kind of thing. Um, and that may have to do, we, there, there's some evidence that that's how we look at, that, that's how our brains kind of figure out, is this person a good mate in terms of reproduction, just basic reproduction. And we don't, we don't want someone who's so different from us that we have difficulty reproducing. And we don't want someone so close to us that um, you know, we have other genetic problems. So those pheromones, those odors, body odors, may play a very large role in that. And that's why odor is actually one of the top things that people rate in terms of their partners. But again, it's going to be after that initial attraction when you've had that ability to be close to one another.
just out of curiosity, I always wonder why <clears throat> some younger men go for older women. Is there an explanation for that? You know, like the, I guess what I, I guess you call it the cougar. I think phenomenon. they've been watching cougar too much. That's what I think. Um, it is what is interesting. It, um, teenage boys and statistically show a preference for women who are around 18, 19, 20. And then as they move into that age range, then they tend to still like 18, 19, 20, and so on. Now remember what I said about our hunter-gatherer past and having babies and being a teenager? It's really hard to reproduce if you're a teenage girl, um, despite what Republicans would like to say. But um, the, so, so young teenage, teenage boys will still find that range of the best fertility, the best chance of reproduction as the most attractive. So that doesn't really answer your question. I think it's just, I, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think it's, again, that comes down to just individual differences. Why some guys like brunettes, some like blondes, some like, you know, tall women, some like short, petite. Um, so it's, yeah. Thank you. I have a suspicion that uh, the importance of physical attributes in selection in a kind of post-industrial state, boy, does that sound, are reduced, <laughs> are, are, are less. Sorry, you get a Marxist on me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because the most powerful sexual attraction has become a sense of humor. And that's from, not from, per yeah, it is from personal experience. So, you know, I can, yeah, you can, a man can talk to a woman infinitely, no matter how beautiful and no matter how ugly he is, as long as he's entertaining her. And of course the difference is that suggests smart. Yeah. yeah. And he don't have to have large biceps to be yeah. smart, and smart is more important. Smart is sexy. Smart intelli Intelligence was on the list of common things. Uh, we don't tend to like dummies. We like intelligent. Both men and women like intelligence. Yeah, my point isn't that we like it, is that it's moving up in the what? list of those things <coughs> that are important, and may even be the most important. Well, probably it actually isn't even post-industrial. That intelligence is what drove the human brain to be the size of, that it was. And it's thought that sexual selection has driven human intelligence more than any other factor. So that's a whole different other lecture. But um, the, I mean, s sexual selection probably is why we are smart. We, our language and music and our creativity, these are all things that, that from a, a very simple Darwinian viewpoint, don't seem to have an explanation. It is our peacock's tail with humans. Why do we have to be so smart? Well, it's not to hunt lions or defend ourselves from lions and hunt antelope. It's smart, sexy. So that's been driving our human behavior and our brain for a long time. Um, the, the physical attributes is what I was focusing on today. But yeah, the brain and intelligence is definitely we're humans. That, that's, our, that's our peacock's tail. And that happens with both sexes. Um, smart women, smart men. Boy, there, there's, it's hard to beat that in terms of sexy. Okay, I have, I have two. Uh, from point of view of men, okay, mm -hmm. uh, no, no, intelli no intelligent, <laughs> but first is sexual attraction for me. Right. And second, women should be born. Because if a uh, woman is boring, even attractive, you are not able to stand her for a long time. Right. And second mm -hmm. question for me is, is it true that in, uh, in evolution, women are more pretty and men constant? Because I read some uh, publication, they researched that women uh, uh, right now more and more pretty, uh, more <coughs> More. Thank goodness for L'Oreal and uh, all those Chanel and all those wonderful cosmetic. Uh, I actually did a lot of work. Um, that was how our lab got paid. Um, <laughs> and then we did all this other stuff on the side. Um, are women more beautiful? 
Are they becoming more beautiful? I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. We are becoming taller as a species. It's not just protein. Um, and so that's sexual selection. Uh, women in, I think, industrialized nations, we do keep ourselves younger looking. And there's a reason for it. I'm all for it. Great, lovely, terrific. Uh, put the cold cream on. I'm ready. Um, youth is obviously, as I said, a signal. Um, and yeah, exactly. In fact, that's, I had this mini, yeah, I mean, we, we, we use sunscreen, we're not working outdoors, uh, we're not um, doing manual labor all the time, we're not, uh, and in fact, I had this little mini theory, there's no way I can, I can ever prove that it's right, um, or even figure out a way to experiment with it. I think one of the reasons in the Middle East why the um, covering started is because of the harshness of the sun. It was a way of keeping um, uh, light-skinned women, uh, because they were based in, in the Middle East. They're far lighter than in Africa, but um, keep that skin from wrinkling. I mean, white skin is horrible. It's just not good for outside. <laughs> it's pretty useless, actually. So um, I, I think that's one reason why head coverings became became um, part of the culture and then it just ended up being absorbed by religion like so many other things, sexual taboos and things. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. So are women becoming more beautiful? I don't know if there's any evidence for that. I just think women take better care of themselves. And so do men, by the way. I mean, I'm at the gym working out and at times I sort of laugh. I mean, here are, you know, 40, 50 other people like me sweating with their headphones on, running on a treadmill, going on down and doing lifts. And I mean, our ancestors would look at us and go, are you just nuts? I mean, that's just crazy because when they could rest, they rested. And hunter-gatherers don't work that hard. I mean, they go out and do a hunt. They gather food, but they actually have far more rest periods than we do. We work, what's an eight-hour day? You know, eight, nine, ten hours. And then we go to the gym and work out and get that exercise so we can be fit. I mean, it is a little bit abnormal and strange if you really think about it. But, um, but we do take better care of ourselves. We eat. We eat healthier, we take care of our teeth, we do all this kind of good stuff. You, you uh, went by a slide uh, quickly that was intriguing. It said fear of the C word. Uh, oh, the commitment the word. word, yeah. And I think we, we, we know that commitment. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's an article of faith in the popular culture that men are fear, uh, yeah. fear of commitment. My, my own personal theory is that in a relationship, since women, some women, statistical probability, tend to set up a series of tests, if not <laughs> traps, some of which are based on trying to By the oh, yeah. time yeah, a guy no, gets to the point where he should commit, he just hates her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I one. suspect, though, that the reason has to do with resources, that a man is, is not only committing to the woman, but he's yeah. committing his resources. Yeah. And in fact, legally, and we even see this in the case of divorce, mm -hmm. a man will continue right. to commit resources. And even in the case of paternity fraud, there have been cases where a man gets a divorce, has a DNA test, finds that three out of four of his children aren't his. Probably why the divorce And the happened. court <laughs> says it's in the best interest yeah. of the child you exactly. continue paying. Because, yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I just like yeah, I mean, I could, a lecture on you on male and, I, I, I mean, I do a, a three-hour course lecture on some of the bizarre differences between males and females that um, are sort of humorous, and it's what comedians talk about. But one reason why men, and, and do, men do commit. I just want to make sure men do commit to relationships. But when a man makes a commitment to a relationship, He's giving up in some ways a lot more than a woman is giving up when, even though a woman might say, I gave you the best years of my life, um, as he runs off with a younger woman who's able to have even more children. So the, the commitment thing for men is he's now reducing his chance of reproductive success with other women. He could be donating sperm to lots of other women. So it's a big commitment reproduction-wise. Why are men willing to make that commitment? One, children who have the resources of a male, of, of a, an, I'm not going to get into all, well, 
you guys know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> um, the resources of a male usually are going to be better off. Higher status, um, they're, they're healthier, um, they have a more stable life. So his offspring have a better chance of reproducing. If he has lots of children by women who are less than quality, and women then those offspring may not have a very good chance of reproducing. So his best bet may be, I'm going to invest in a high quality female, I'm going to invest in our offspring, and that's going to be my best reproductive success. Because we know that humans are, we take a lot of care and a lot of time to reach reproductive age. So the commitment thing for men is a very big trade-off. For women, the trade-off is, um, you know, could I have gotten someone better and trade up, which women still do, um, as, we, as we know. Um, but it, it's not the same sort of trade-off. Because a woman is pretty much going to have the same number of children no matter what. And hunter-gatherer societies, three to four children reaching adulthood was about it. You know, there were no, you know, eight, 12 children that um, didn't happen. There was no way you were going to have eight or 12 children out on the savanna. So for a woman, um, she, she's trading good genes, maybe, the healthy immune system that is denoted by the more masculine looking face. And um, so she may be trading off genes, but having that commitment to the offspring is the trade-off. So that's part of it. And then all the other stuff, the, the behaviors that men and women do, women do that. I mean, women do tend to, again, we're talking statistics. Um, I mean, ladies, we can admit it. We do tend to uh, remember the the time that he forgot us at the bus station or uh, went home from work without picking us up. And I mean, even if it happened 20 years ago, we're liable to bring that up. Remember when you forgot me at the bus station and you went out and watched the football game and I was standing in the rain? And Women do tend to do that. Now, why do women tend to do that? Because those are all signals of commitment. And women are really good at keeping track of signals of commitment. And this is where that mind reading thing comes in. And I always warn people, don't mind read. Don't try not to mind read. And it is difficult. Um, women, but women are constantly looking for signals of, of um, commitment. She wouldn't have to tell us. Well, <laughs> and women do, also women communicate with one another differently than they do, than men communicate with one another. There are definite differences in how men and women communicate. Um, and women do, and I, do tend to find this somewhat annoying with women. So I get to knock women because I am female. Um, we tend to talk something to death. We just won't let it go. And our female friends tend to encourage that behavior. And that's why I tend to avoid women when I'm going through any kind of issues at times because I don't want to hear them, you know, going on about, oh, that guy is just a creep. and run, run, run. So women tend to do that. Men, on the other hand, do the other thing, which is, you know, they focus on work. They don't talk. They, you know, they just hope it, you know, kind of just all is going to get, get better, and they don't communicate. So that's a basic male-female difference. It causes all kinds of problems. And men and women need to sort of learn to adjust to that and, and learn that yeah, those differences do happen. If we're going to have a good relationship, we need to kind of put up with that. I, I would just like to say that it, in a relationship, when you, you have a problem and you walk into a room and there she is with her friends and they oh, all yeah. look at you and you realize, <laughs> my God, they all know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, women are guilty of that. I mean, they, we are. Um, um, it, it's it's yeah. Go ahead. So, if women are the choosers in, in, among humans, uh, why is it that the men aren't wearing the makeup? Oh no, we're choosers, and 
both are choosy. Both are the choosers when it comes to a committed relationship. Um, men don't wear makeup. They drive the Ferrari and the Mercedes and, um, and, and the business suit or the, the football uniform. And there there were times when, however, men, men dressed flamboyantly, yes. you know, particularly in Renaissance. In yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and so the, in the sense that they were putting on the display then. Yeah. So, I mean, men display. Men display all the time. Um, I mean, it's the, yeah, uh, men display all kinds of different ways than women. Women focus on what men find attractive. Okay, here's a, here's a good quiz. Here's a good bar thing, you know, next time you, when you want it. What's the first part of the female anatomy that starts to change with the onset of puberty? Any guesses? Come on, somebody, I heard breasts. Okay, I know you guys were thinking that because I, you know, speak up. Um, but, and you're wrong. It is not. How, how many of you like to see women in three inch high heels? Oh, come on. Jeez. <laughs> yes, it's the calf. It's the calf. Why do women suffer through high heels? It shows off the calf. It's the first part of the female anatomy that starts to change to signal the onset of puberty. I don't know why that's what evolution did. I mean, I don't know why it happens to be the calf, but that's it. The female calf, the female calf is, for many men, very, very sexy. Why do, um, you know, we focus on that. But it's, but, but it's, well, I mean, but, I mean, it just, it, so that's why women wear high heels. Did we know that when we started to wear high heels? No, we didn't. But somehow, through our history, some women figured out if we wear high heels and we weren't wearing the long skirts anymore, because then, because um, it used to be that men wore high heels and women didn't, because men wanted the height. But as women's shirts, um, skirts shortened, we could show off our calves. But all the men designed the shoes. Yeah, right. <laughs> and your point is <laughs> because they want to look at the calves. Yeah, exactly. And and you know what? And you know uh, and they, do they do make your feet hurt. Um, it is you know. I'm I confess I'm a shoe. I have a shoe fetish. In the ancient century, <laughs> men wore padded socks. Yep. So that their calves look Mas masculine. They looked bigger, muscle wise, and they did a lot of things. I mean, they wore cod pieces too. So. Um, so through, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, back to back to communication. Mm -hmm. Women speak elliptically and with nuance, and it makes men crazy because she says two days later, "Did you pick up my birthday present or something?" She says, "I don't know. What? What? We? When did you say that?" Yeah, w women need to be able to learn to be a little bit more direct, and men need to li learn to listen a little bit better. I mean, it, it is. It's 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 the, it's the sex differences. Um, Women would, I mean, we'd both be a lot better off if we learned how to communicate with one another. Um, although maybe not at times. Um, sometimes. You're, you're, saying, <laughs> so, you're saying that's not driven by genes, but that's driven by upbringing and social. No, no, I think, I, no, uh, women tend to have better language skills. We tend to, so women did not evolve with strength, and um, so we had to negotiate social rank through. Um, through language and some through nuance. Studies, a lot of studies on that now have been showing that, that women talk, men and women talk just as much. There, there's not much. I know there was something I read within the past year that had kind of like. I'd, ha I'd have to look at it. Well, basically, the studies do show that, that women. Um, that they have a higher vocabulary. Think, yeah, what, what, I, yeah. uh, what I have seen is women talking to women talk more than men talking to men um, in women and men talking together, men actually tend to talk more. Yeah, because the women are engaging them. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily do that. So, um, and it's not that, and, and I, I mean, you can look at things like how men and women sit together. When a woman is sitting, having a conversation with another woman, she'll lean forward, she'll touch, they'll, there's going to be touching involved um, if they're good friends. And um, men will sit side by side, you know, and the distance, right? So, I mean, it's even even things like that that we see these male-female differences come about. Um, 
of course, and, and that will somewhat different culture cultures where there, where there's a lot of where the, the population is quite high. People do tend to the space between them becomes smaller and smaller, but you still find those you'll still find some of those differences. But um, in, in the United States, you know, we're such a big country, we tend to spread out a lot more. So um, it's very interesting that sort of a meta-analysis of when on, what went on, you were talking primarily about um, evolutionary pressures and secondary sexual characteristics and establishing behaviors, certainly maybe behavior <coughs> with animals and with people as well. And then all the questions focused on behavior and um, the pressures of society, um, how uh, health care and affluence have modified our behaviors with respect to, um, to each other, being married older and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so are we making uh, evolutionary theory irrelevant? Absolutely. Or, or is it? Um, I mean, it's, it's an excellent question. And it's, it's you know, certainly one that have, has been wrestled with. You know, how, how much have we? I mean, in some ways, it's you know nice to think that you know some of the Darwinian selection that were not as brutish, and and I mean things like tribalism, in fact, is an evolved behavior. Um, racism basically is an evolved behavior. Doesn't mean we have to accept it. Um, it doesn't. So we we hope to. And I'll, I guess this will be the last question then, or maybe. Um, but I mean, we have there's. A, um, there's a wonderful book by Jonathan Glover called Morality that goes back to around the 1500s and looks at how morality among humans has changed so much. Now, this is through social pressure. And probably there, might, there may even be some Darwinian pressure in terms of uh, you know, who was able to secure better mates. Um, if you were a, a brute and um, a horrible human being, you know, you're probably not going to attract a lot of, a lot of females if you're a guy. So um, there's there's some. It, it's a really wonderful book to show how, it, as discouraging as as things still are at times, we we are so much nicer as a species <laughs> than we used to be. I mean, we're so much nicer. We care about people. I mean, the whole thing and things even like television and media and the internet make. Everyone around the world, our neighbor. Now, our evolved brains, as far as um, who we know, our brain—I mean, media hasn't been around long enough for our brains to really differentiate between what's on television. I mean, we do cognitively, but what's on television? How we see people? When we see somebody suffering, like after the the Haiti earthquake. Um, when you see a child suffering, our heart. I mean, we're never going to meet this person. But it tugs at all those Darwinian things because our Darwinian brain never expected us to be helping people outside of our gene pool, all out of our population pool. So it still taps into that. And then society lays over that and gives us an opportunity to tap into those nice evolved mechanisms, like being kind to people, other people. Being, um, you know, lending our resources to not, you know, why we evolved to lend our resources to family members, we now are able to see other people as members of our family. So we can, through social change, we can tap into those good Darwinian aspects of us and, and try to get rid of those uglier parts of our human nature that, that we don't like. like you know, killing one another and violence and and racism and and hatred. So, you know, I I think that we and and the trend is showing that we are better, despite what we see on Fox News sometimes. Um, we do actually see a, a much better trend. Um, I think you have been raising your hand for a while. Um, the criteria you laid out for sexual selection for females is, I think, well documented. Uh, however, it does fluctuate depending on where a woman is right. in her cycle. cycle yeah. So what is the effect of modern birth control? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So, did everybody hear that? Okay, so birth control pills um, do you actually have an effect on, on female selection. And we did this study in our, in our lab. And we were, all, we were always trying, having a hard time finding females who uh, were not on birth control because it was college students. Um, and <laughs> 
So um, birth control basically convinces the body that you're pregnant. That's what the higher estrogen level does. So we did find that women who were on birth control or in the part of their cycle um, where they, um, their estrogen levels where their estrogen levels were higher, where they're not um, ovulating, right? Um, they, they tended to like the soccer dad more than the masculine guy. But when women are ovulating and they're not on birth control, they tend to like the more masculine, good genes guy. Now, does, does this mean that women will, well, let me back up a second. Studies have shown that women, when they're ovulate, will show more skin, will wear more jewelry, more bling. And um, of course, that's now kind of part of our, people know that now. I mean, people are, women especially are more aware when they're ovulating. Men tend to be attracted to women who are ovulating. Um, now, how much of that is unconscious, but um, I'll give, I'll end this with one little story out of one of my classes. It was a summer course. And in, this is in Colorado, and so it's warm in Colorado and Colorado Springs. And uh, it was a big class, about 100 people. And there were these two young co-eds, twins, very nice looking, long blonde hair, slender, fairly tall. I mean, you know, they could have been models. And um, they would always come into class, and they would wear shorts and low-cut T-shirts. And I gave, so about... It might have been the third or fourth day. It was a compressed course, so it was a daily lectures of eight hours a day. Um, I started talking about ovulation and women showing more skin when they were ovulating. And, of course, I'm watching this whole big auditorium with the students, and I'm seeing the guys all kind of doing, you know, all trying not to look, trying not to look. Because um, they, 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 these women did kind of stand out. They were very good looking. And they weren't, you know, dressed badly that they were, you know, it was summertime. But the next day and for the rest of the class, they came in in sweatpants and a sweat <laughs> and a sweatshirt. And it was, it, I mean, I, it was funny. It, it was just it's su such a, a keen observation because I also could see them kind of looking at each other like, oh, Oh dear, you know. <laughs> and uh, who knows? I don't know if they were ovulating at the same. Because sisters do tend to ovulate at the same time as they're if they're living together. But um, anyway, so I will end on that note. <laughs>